Hi everyone, welcome to Let's Celebrate TV Live. I'm your host, Peter Lee. With me today, as always, doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. He's the power behind the throne. He's a director, producer, cameraman, my IT guy, my oftentimes chauffeur, and he's also my husband, Phil Gornimer. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where you're watching us from or on replay. We're a little scraggly this morning. We might have been up very late last night. Well, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I've got a cocktail for us today. This is going to be coming up in uh, an episode before Easter. Wait till you see this. Look at this color. This is a citrusy carrot cocktail that we're calling the Buzzed Bunny. Look at that glorious color. And yes, I said carrot, as in carrot juice. And I'm going to garnish with a little carrot rose. Would you like me to deliver this to you, dear? Or will you come and get it? I'll come and get it. Okay. Give people time to uh, mm -hmm. jump in chat and tell us where they're from and all that good stuff. All right. Well, we're getting our vegetables anyway. Yeah. A little hair of the dog. Mm, that's quite it's yummy. really good. I don't know how you can make carrot creamy, but it it's, is. It's sweet, it's citrusy, it's carroty, but it's very refreshing. All right. So today we're talking all about cast iron, cast iron cooking. We're going to debunk some myths. Uh, we were talking about doing a lot of cooking today with my cast iron, but it occurred to us that almost every episode I use my cast iron. So you've certainly seen me. If you watch our show, you've seen me cook in my cast iron before, and you will again. Uh, so let's just start talking about some generic cast irons. This guy here is my favorite. This is my oldest piece that I've had the longest. Uh, it's not old as in age, but it's one that I've owned longer than any other one. It's, it's the one that got me started. This was made by uh, Lewis and Clark, Camp Chef. You kind of see that on there. I have had this 20 plus years, dear. Yeah, at least. Yeah. And I this is really my go-to. I use it almost every single day. It's very well seasoned. I never worry about it. It never lets me down. And I have some though that are a lot, lot older. And we'll get to them. But this is my go-to, my workhorse. Um, some other things you may have seen. You've probably seen me use this guy a lot, or perhaps this purple guy behind it. I have several colors of these Dutch ovens and brazers and things. Again, this one's by Lodge. Never lets me down. I've had this, what, 15, 16 years? Yeah, I think so. Easily, yeah. Whatever. Yeah, but... Uh, these are some of my favorite pieces, and, and I didn't realize how much cast iron I've collected over the years until this morning when I was digging them all out to bring and have here, and it's like, oh, I may have a problem. So let's talk about uh, pros and cons of cast iron. Of course, to me, the biggest pro is they are just about indestructible. They will last generations and generations. This piece here is a uh, cornbread skillet and it was given to be to me by a friend who was 91 when she died and it was her mother's so that tells you how old this is now I haven't used it in a while it needs a good cleaning and uh, but I have used this many times and, and it, it never fails again I just don't make cornbread that often um, but when I do I usually use this because it's perfect little portions and uh you know, you've got a little rust in there, but that's okay. That's not the end of the world. So this is older than both me and Phil. All right, well, let's see who's here and where they're from. Oh, yeah. We encourage you to, oop, let me get me on screen here. Super source. Hello. There we go. Go ahead. I encourage you to tell us in chat where you're watching us from so we can stick you on the map. Feel free to ask any questions. We will do our best to answer them live. Um, so let's see, we have 
our live stream chat people and our Facebook people. So let me bring one of them up here and stick them on the map. All right, hey, so Mary. we got Mary, and then Alice. we've got a first timer, Poppy. Hi, Poppy. Here, let's Welcome just, to Let's Celebrate TV. Let's just zoom in on this map a little bit. There we go. Hopefully we won't have any European people today. All right, oh, speaking of that, we got Toronto, Canada. All right, hi, Jamie. Jamie. Welcome. All right, let me That's see. That's awesome. Who else? Got to go through this list. Ah, uh, we know this one. Oh, yes. And from New York. it's blustery and cold. Yes, it is. It was 29 yes. degrees here. Yeah. Yesterday it was in the 50s, and today it's 29. And Carl, what is it in Florida? He's from Wilton Manors. Wow. We're all over the place. And of course, Hank isn't here, but he was in earlier. Hold on. I, I got his message oh, somewhere. Do? There okay, we go. There he is. So he's in Phoenix, so yeah. we're getting there. So again, let us know in chat where you Mm -hmm. where you're from, and we will bring good. the map up later and check you out. Yeah. Hopefully some of our European peeps will uh, check in with us too. So, you know, back to cast iron. So it comes in various shapes, sizes, um, uses, colors, everything. Speaking of older, older things, I have some here that a friend gifted me. I've never used them. I'm going to have to give them a good, good cleaning. Um, but they're these little handy pans. Um, I don't know who makes them. Oh, this one says Wagner Ware, Sydney. <laughs> Whatever that is. What? <laughs> Had to save the cocktail. <laughs> That's awesome. The buzzed bunny. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this one looks like it's also Wagner made. I don't know what you'd use it for, maybe a single egg or a cookie or something, because you can bake in it. But I like these little guys. If I'm doing a breakfast or something, I want to serve everyone a little individual skillet. And this is what I would use them for. Someday I'll use them. I'm not getting rid of them. I'll clean them up. But this, I have no idea how old they are. They seem really, really old. So they're not delicate little flowers. They're, they're meant to be used, and they can take it. All right, so we'll go through probably what's the top 10 myths. Yeah. We'll tell you what's a myth. I'll try to give you a history of how that myth came to be. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll kind of go from there. So let me go back to you. Back and to me, Bob. Back to you, Bob. Myth let me number one. Let me get my notes ready because. Yeah, okay, ready? I'm ready. <laughs> myth number one seasoning equals flavor. Okay, seasoning if it's salt and pepper. Sure, that equals flavor, but not seasoning on your cast iron. And I think where that comes from, and dear correct me if I'm wrong, is people equate the fact that on cast iron you get a good hard sear on things. That is flavor. Pop a steak in this and you're gonna get that screaming hot metal, great crust on your steak, that's the flavor. But that's not the seasoning on the pan, correct? Correct, yes. and that seasoning, uh, is just layers and layers of oil that have built up and polymerized, polymerized yeah. and reacted with the mm -hmm. metal. And the more you cook with it, the better it gets. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go on to myth number two. You can use X method to get perfect shiny seasoning. Well, I, I don't quite understand that one. I guess people have their own ways of seasoning and own methods. And a lot of old pans when they get seasoned, like this one, I've been using almost daily for a long time. It's smoother than some of my newer ones um, because the seasoning is just built up over all these years. So I never worry about it. Uh, but people have different methods that they think. And honestly, I think that just use and use over years will get you this. If it's a little rough, it doesn't mean it's not seasoned. This has just been seasoned longer. But I know people say, like, you can use oil and upside down the oven for six hours. and, and... So let's talk about um, seasoning as far as buying a cast iron pan. Right. So most cast iron pans, you must season when you get them. The latest craze, probably in about the last 15 years, is companies like Lodge, who's probably the biggest 
maker um, mm -hmm. in the in the U.S. comes pre-seasoned. Well, like this little guy that I just got. These two are two of my newest pieces. They're both by Lodge. I know this is not a commercial for Lodge, but Lodge, if you're out there watching, this is. <laughs> Um, but they came pre-seasoned. So you can see it looks and it feels a little rougher than my old guy over here. But like this one, I've fried eggs on this already and they came right up, no sticking, no nothing. All right, so uh, where are we here? So there's nothing wrong with pre-seasoned pans. No. You're just going to add to that as you use right. it each time. So how do you season a pan that's not seasoned at all? Right. Or it's been pre-seasoned from the factory, but now you're going to use it for that first time. Or you've got one like he's got in his hands right Old now. Old guy that needs to that be That needs to be cleaned yeah. and, and off. How can you season the easiest way? Well, there's lots of debate on the method of seasoning. The most agreed upon method, which works for an initial seasoning, doesn't take that long. You're going to use an oil. Any high temperature oil will work. Canola oil, rapeseed oil, which yep. is about if the same thing. If you happen to have access to flaxseed oil, flaxseed oil yeah. that's the best because Grape it doesn't seed oil smoke. Would be Anything good. except something that's fruity or tasty. So you wouldn't use olive oil. Right. You wouldn't use corn oil. You yeah, canola use oil. oil. You're going to take a paper towel. You're going to put a tablespoon in there. You're going to wipe it all around the inside, mm -hmm. the outside, and the handle. You're going to preheat your oven to 450 degrees. You're going to put a pan in the bottom of the oven to catch the drippings and put your pan upside down on the top shelf. And you're going to bake it in there for one hour. Have the fans on because it's probably going to smoke like crazy. Yeah, and not smell very good. Right. And what you want to make sure is there's not a lot of oil. So when you've put that tablespoon of oil on, before you actually put it in the oven, wipe it out again and put it in there in an hour, yeah. turn it off, let it cool, feel it. If it still feels a little rough, do it a second time and that's it. But really just use your pans. Use your pans. I tend to uh, use just regular cooking spray on mine. I looked for, uh, what is it, flaxseed oil mm -hmm. and I couldn't find it. So I've been doing the way I do it the way my mother did it. So. Uh, Hundreds of years in my family. Works for us. All right, myth number three, cast iron is a high maintenance diva. Well, that's not true. There's a lot of pros to cast iron. Like I said, they never let you down. They are virtually indestructible. I mean, come on, they make battleships out of iron and bombs and things like, this is meant to last. Do you have to care for it? Of course you do, you have to take care of your stuff. So would I throw this in the dishwasher? No. But I'm going to wash it, I'm going to keep it clean in one season, and I'm going to use it. Um, I think it gets that myth because if you do let water sit on it for too long, you might get a little rusting. So people think that, you know, it's this delicate little thing, and it really isn't. Of course, one of the, co the cons to cast iron is it's heavy. And that's actually a pro and a con. Um, we can get into that later, the pros and cons more, but that's one of the big thing is people think if they get the least little bit of water on their pan or anything acidic, it's going to ruin it and, and they can't use it anymore. And that simply isn't true. Or they'll maintain that you have to have special tools. You can't use metal. You can't use this. It's iron at the end of the day. You're right. not going to hurt it. And in a well-seasoned pan, you're not going to scrape off right. the seasoning. It's our, not delicate. I mean, our grandmothers didn't have have, you know, nylon plastic utensils. They had wood or metal, and they probably use metal on their cast irons. All right, let's do the one that causes the most angst. Oh, but before we do that, let's check in with our Facebook ah. chat people. Any questions? Because we got lots of questions from those guys. Oops, hold Oops. on. I got to get rid of the, the one display. There we go. There we go. Mm. Okay. Okay, I find cast iron pans at garage sales for a dollar, a little cleanup, and it's something I have up. for 20 plus. Okay. He's got 20 of them. Good I for 20 you. 20 plus. Good for you, Jack. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people do that. They'll, they'll, you know, because 
some old relative dies, their house is being cleaned out, and it's their great-great-grandmother's <coughs> cast iron pan, and people go, I don't want that, it's too blah and icky, and they sell it, and uh, yeah, a little effort, and you have this wonderful pan. Well, and again, way too many people think as soon as you see rust, the pan is ruined, right. it's garbage, you've got to get rid of it. Yeah. Or those who might know that, well, yeah, it's not ruined, but it's a lot of work to fix it. It's not. It really is a lot it's of work. It's not a lot at all. Right. All right, let's see what else we got going on here. Yeah, I know we had a lot come in. We Oops. did. A lot came in. If I can get the right screen up over here. Come on. There we, we go. Too many buttons today. I had too many buttons today. We camp with our cast iron pans and cook right over the fire from Beth. You know, you know, we do too. I have cast iron up at our campsite in the mountains, and there have been plenty of times where we have decided, uh, why use the stove and be convenient? Let's build a fire and cook over the open fire tonight. So uh, that's great. I love doing that. Especially, you know, like this guy, over the fire, steak in there or a burger or something. Yeah. What? Cast iron steak and cocktails. Well, Just yeah. saying. Well, you said it like it's a bad thing. I didn't say it was a bad thing. All right, and oh, I wonder That's if he has nuts. had one of the minis like you have. My dad just made the best cornbread in a mini cast iron pan. Oh, sure. Yep. I when I make a big batch of cornbread, I'll use this guy if I need like a double batch. Um, otherwise, I'll use my little skillet. I have it made. I don't remember last time I made cornbread, dear. It's a while, but you've made it in the 10 inch. Yeah. Now that you have a 14 inch or well, 12 yeah. inch, which is that's a lot of cornbread there? for just, it, it's back there. I'll bring it out eventually. I don't need to show them my whole collection piece by piece, um, except Lodge if you're listening. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, but. I do, I have a great big 14 incher that I, I just got along with the other two and, and I've been using that a lot lately too. I can't imagine making that much cornbread just for the two of us though, dear. Well, but if you lift it up and down, you don't have to go to the gym anymore. Well, that's true, that is true. All right, let's All right. get back to, to uh, our myths. let's go to the next Number myth. Four. This, let's spend some time okay. on this one, because okay. this is the biggie. Yeah, now, I always swore I would never do a broadcast like this, because this myth right here is the most polarizing thing, and when I've leaned toward it before and made little side comments, I've gotten a lot of pushback from people. So all I'm going to say now is don't come at me for what I'm about to say, because you're wrong, and I'll tell you why. So the myth is you should never wash your cast iron with soap. And that's just not true. A lot of people think that uh, if you wash it with soap, you're gonna wash the oils off, especially we all use Dawn. It takes the grease out of your way. You're gonna wash that seasoning right off. If you use metal on it, you're gonna scrape it off. If you dunk it in the sink, you're gonna, that's not true. A lot of people will just use like a brush and salt, but that doesn't really get it clean. It might get most of the gunk off of it. Um, and that sort of makes no sense because if you were saying I'm going to use a sponge and kosher salt, how much more gritty is that than the people who say, well, I can't use a metal spatula because right. I might scrape it. Right. There's no reason why you cannot put this in some hot soapy water, give it a wipe out, even with the scrubby side of a sponge, get it clean. The key is after that's done, after you've rinsed it well, is to dry it properly. Get it all the way dry. Don't just use the towel on it. I will dry it out with a towel, then I put it on a burner, and I turn the burner up high, and I let it get screaming hot, and it's amazing how much will evaporate. Then, once I shut, it, I shut it off, I let it cool down, but while it's still warm, I give it a light coat of oil, wipe it out, and I let it cool, done. That's maintaining the seasoning, it's getting it clean. Uh, we have a friend who, uh, she just takes a paper towel and wipes it out, and puts it back in her cabinet. And I cringe eating at their house when she pulls out that pan because in all the years we've known her, um, that pan has never been cleaned properly. And so, okay. So let's give you a little history. Why has everyone said you should never use soap in your cast iron? There's a partial truth to that. And that's in the early 20th century, most between the, uh, no later than the 40s or the 50s, Lye was the primary ingredient in soap. Yep. 
lye is needed in the manufacturing process to make soap, but in the earlier generations, lye was actually in the soap. Today, lye is still used in manufacturing, but it's not in soap. So lye, yes, can in fact, over time, remove the seasoning. There hasn't been lye in dish soap since the 50s. Mm -hmm. And things like Dawn and all that were specifically designed yeah. to remove this and not affect pans. Right. And uh, both Lodge's site and most of the cast iron yeah. sites yeah. and even Dawn dishwashing say, wash it. You're right. not going right. to hurt it. I mean, if you leave it soaking in soapy water overnight and you pull it out and it's all icky and rusty, well, that's on you because you shouldn't do that. That's just extreme. Or if you were to put this in the dishwasher, you're going to get what you get. But dunk it in the sink, let it soak for a few minutes if you need to, and then washing it like normal, it, it, it's fine. The key is getting it all the way dry. I clean my pan in an easy way. I add one inch of water and bring it to a boil, empty oil, dry oil, and done. That's another way to do it too, especially if even the most seasoned pan, something will occasionally stick to it. Um, and that's a great way to get things off if you don't want to be scraping on it. Uh, you know, that's not a terrible way to do it either. But I just find washing it with soap and water. Like All right, we're going to get to this one later, but it's, it's a good thing to bring up early. I gave up on my cast iron frying pan. It burns everything. Okay, yeah, we'll come back to that. It doesn't, and we'll yeah. tell you why. Yeah, yep. Yeah. All right. What's next? Oh, so someone else is, does kosher salt. Grandma used cleaner, cast iron with kosher salt and soft sponge. Yeah, a lot of people do it that way. Um, I, I just don't think that gets, gets it really clean. All right, let's add a few more to the map while we're here. Yay. Get back to my screen with the maps. All right, so we got Lance from Huntington. Yay, Lance. And was then, just here a few hours ago. <laughs> which is why we're up till 1 o'clock in the morning. It might be a little tired and, well, yeah, we'll just say. And then we got Hi, Ted. Ted from New York City. Ted and we got Jerry. Two Hi, from guys. New York City today. Yep. All right, is that everybody for the map? I think so. Mm -hmm. Let me go back. We'll keep adding more to them as we go yep. along. Uh, yep. Oops, we're almost coming up to my time. Oops, someone's... Uh... What? I need to see more cats. Well, <laughs> there was just one running around. I don't know where he went. Uh, there's, um, they're still in PTSD mode from having eight people over. And yeah, for dinner A couple of them were night. quaking under the couch for, for days. All right, what's next here? Oh. Myth number five. That's oh, you want that notes. one. Okay, let's talk well, about this. Well, if we're going in order. Yep. I mean, so let's go in order. And we can do spend some time on this one because you have your blue one here too. Mm -hmm. Myth number five, never cook acidic food in your cast iron. Maybe partially true. Maybe. So this guy, my old reliable, I have cooked acidic foods in this for years but it's well seasoned, it's well used. So for me to do pasta and tomatoes or something acidic like with wine, absolutely, I'm gonna use it. This one, my new Lodge, is still new. So Lodge recommends, you can absolutely, but maybe not the first few times, let your seasoning build up. Let the, get a little more use in it before you start doing acidic foods. So, yeah. And it's also recommended you can cook acidic foods, but yeah. after about a half an hour, you might pick up a vague metallic taste, right. very similar to canned tomatoes when you haven't cooked out the canned flavor. Right. But because for for 20, 30 minutes or deglazing, it's yeah. perfectly yeah. fine. Mm -hmm. The acid is not going to hurt um, any part right. of the seasoning. Just it may bring up some of that iron, you know which isn't necessarily bad for you, but you, it may affect the flavor. And the more, whoops, get right screen. Um, the more seasoned the pan is, the less this right, ever becomes right. an issue. Because that seasoning acts as a layer between the acid and the pan itself. All right. All right. So we'll do one more and then we'll, we'll do my little I'm... spiel. You'll get to take a break. Okay, yay. So you might need your notes for this one because this one's a long one. It is. And okay. 
Number six. Number six, cast iron is good or bad for you. So there are a lot of claims out there about different types of cookware. Um, aluminum is bad for you, it causes dementia, it causes Alzheimer's. Teflon is bad for you, it causes cancer. Cast iron is bad for you, it causes this. Cast iron is good for you because you get your iron, you can get your daily iron from your cast iron. That's not exactly true. None of that is really true. Um, you do get from your cast iron a small, small amount, especially if you cook something acid in it. And, you know, if you have an iron deficiency, well, then that's probably good news for you. Uh, it might not be good news if you have too much iron and people are on, can be either way. But the quantities that the food absorbs is really so low, it's, it's not likely to have any type of effect on you. It may affect the flavor, but that's about it. Um, there's really, it, it's all just blah. It's, it's all fake, fake news. And, oops, hold on, and, right button again. Yes, please. And contrary to belief, um, when you add, compared to Teflon, Cast iron requires more oil to avoid sticking. So, so if people say, well, it needs more oil, therefore it's bad for you. But cast iron needs it because it spreads out the heat. Right. So, yeah, uh, you can cook your egg in a nonstick Teflon pan with no oil or the tiniest drop of fat of whatever kind. You're going to need to use more in this, absolutely. So it's pros and cons. It, it, it's up to you to decide. But the fact that one is necessarily better for you or worse for you than the other really, I think, is just all silliness and a myth. Okay, I keep seeing your cursor. I all know. Over me. Like, what are you doing, dear? All <laughs> you right, want to reach so Lance says the little ones are good for frittatas. Yep. Little individual omelets. Mm -hmm. All right, and Lance has got. Why cast iron over copper pans? Cost. Well, there's cost, for one. Um, copper pans, will the heat will spread more evenly, consistently. Cast iron pans will hold the heat better. They're not necessarily evenly heating as well as some of the others, but they're going to hold the heat a lot longer. All right, it's my turn. It's your turn? Okay. It's my turn. Back to you, Bob. Yeah, back to me, Bob. Let me find my correct super source here. Laptop and fill. We put that right there. And then we go to... All right. As most of you know, I spend a lot of time going out to the YouTube and saying hi to other content creators who are doing channels just like ours because making a YouTube channel is hard work. So today, I want to introduce you to a channel called That Dude Can Cook. And this is Sonny. And Sonny has 20 years of professional cooking under his belt. And sort of like us, he doesn't want to teach you a recipe. He wants to teach you how to cook. Mm -hmm. And you can make your own recipe. So it's very, very, very similar. He's got amazing videos. He does about one every five or six days. Very, very well done from an editing point of view. And he's got a lot of really good stuff. Matter of fact, the last one he just did, um, he's doing a chicken fried steak, how it's been done in 50 different states. He's also very, very prolific. He has an Instagram channel. He has a Facebook channel. And his Facebook channel has 3,000 plus people. He's got... A TikTok. Now, we're not TikTokers, but if you're into YouTube shorts, which we'll get there eventually. Probably after very the fact goes away, we'll catch up to and that. And if you're a Snapchatter, he's also got Snapchat. So it's lots of good stuff. So take a minute, go out to his channel. The link to his channel is in the show notes below. You can just click on it, find he's a video. He's not exactly small, though. What's that? He's not exactly small. No, he's got one point. Oh, 1.35 million. Yeah, huh? I'm surprised that you chose that. <laughs> That's not a small channel, dear. Yeah. Oops. Doesn't matter. He's really good. You know, click, say hi, tell him you came from here, help him out. And yeah, maybe he'll give us a shout out on his channel. There you go. All right, back to you. Back to me, Bob. All right, what's our next myth? Uh, hold on. Let me catch up with our Facebook people because oh, yeah, they're getting yeah, yeah. annoyed with me. Okay. 
oh, this is an interesting way of looking at it. Okay. I like enamel coated cast iron Dutch oven since it eliminates the need for seasoning. Yeah, absolutely. But it does not eliminate the need to use more oil than you would in a nonstick pan because things will stick to the enamel faster than anything. So why don't you show off the um, inside of an enameled pan? Oh my goodness. You like mm -hmm. to see me work and lift heavy things, don't you? Yep. Ugh. Here's my lodge again. <laughs> um, this is a well-used, and as some of you out there are gonna be clutching your pearls because there's some staining, but you know, after 20 years, 15 years, however long I've had this, it's chipped in a couple places, the enamel, but it's well-used, and yeah, I love it. And you're right, I don't have to season this. And I use this for everything from frying to, to stewing. We do lamb shanks in this. We've done coca van in this. I know this one. I'm not sure if you do. How do I avoid my cast iron frying pan getting sticky? So I believe when that happens most of the time, like some of these old ones, there's some residue buildup that's kind of sticky. And that's probably because they weren't cleaned out properly. There's too much oil sitting in the pan and it gets all tacky and uh, gross. Yeah, basically what they've done is that we want you to put in a little light coating of oil right. and wipe it out before you put it away and you put too much in there and it sat enough. over time. Right. How do you fix that? All you need to do is put it in the sink, rub it with a little soap and water, put it in that 450 degree oven upside down for an hour without adding any extra oil and either it will polymerize There's or it will burn off. And I mean, if it is if it is just that sticky and gross, you can always hit it with uh, steel wool to get it off completely and just start the process of seasoning all over again. What's the difference between a grill pan and a cast iron pan? So, you know, grill pans can be stainless steel, they can be cast iron. I've got a couple grill pans here. I have my fit, new favorite, and you'll never believe who made this one. Uh, and then I have a great big one over here that I use uh, when I'm doing a lot of things. Uh, but it, it's cast iron. It just has ridges to make those grill marks. So you treat it the same way. It's a little trickier to clean. I just use a brush to do it. But, you know, I do the exact same thing when I put it away. Light coating of oil, wipe it out carefully with a paper towel, and that's that. Cast iron Dutch oven has been passed down four generations in my family. That's awesome. That's wonderful. And what I would wonder what you make with that. Like, is there one meal like, oh, you're pulling out grandma's pot. You're making her goulash or chili or whatever. That's what I would do. I have one of those iron griddles that came with my stove that goes over two burners. I have one, too, that came with my cooktop. I didn't bring it down. Um, but, yeah, I have one. It's pretty handy. Mm, and, of course, I have this grill pan here that fits over two burners. Uh, YouTube side of chat's very quiet today. Oh, well. Oh, well. Maybe we're not the only people who had a late night. <laughs> we know Lance had a late, late night, Lance and Ken, since they were here. <laughs> here we go. Someone's confirming what I said. Yeah. Lifting cast iron is a workout who needs to go to the gym. And that's one of the cons of it. You know, with my little aluminum cookware, like my nonstick pans, we've talked about it. We've, we did a base of skills, the flip, and people are flipping like this. I can do it with this little pan, but I couldn't do it with my big guy. But you've got there. those sidewalls of the wrong type. Right, that's true. So that's one that doesn't, it's not very conducive to that. Okay. Myth number seven, seasoned iron gets as non-stick as Teflon. Not quite, but almost. So, for example, this guy who's still pretty new and came pre-seasoned, and I've been using him, and you can see where I've cooked on it. Um, I've already fried eggs on this, and they did not stick or anything. It's great. I had enough oil on the pan, too, but will it get non-stick and things won't... Well, like you can do eggs and things like that. Absolutely. Um, but you're always going to have to have a little oil or grease or butter or something in there. Whereas cast uh, Teflon, you, you really don't. I do anyway when I use my nonstick pans because it tastes better. 
But with Teflon, you can crack an egg into a cold pan and it slides out when it's cooked. Yep. Cast iron, on the other hand, needs to be preheated and oiled thoroughly for it to work best. It needs the heat and the oil as a slick surface and then it won't stick. Teflon, you know, works that way. You also can't sear foods in Teflon. That's true. But you can in cast iron. Yep. And that's because you can't heat Teflon high enough mm -hmm. to get it to sear and it does not hold heat like right. cast iron does. You'll get things to get browned, but by the time you get that brown crust on them, it's, it's overdone. fully cooked or overcooked. Whereas you can get this streaming hot, slap a steak on there, and in a few moments you've got that nice crust on there. This is an interesting one, especially since you have both types with you. Okay, what's that? Is this another myth or is this a question? Oh, sorry. I gotta get rid of the myth then you can see it. Is it the case that thicker pans are better quality than thinner pans? Personally, I say thicker is better, and I'll show you why. Let me get rid of this and move some stuff around. Yeah. So, I don't know who made this one. Phil got this for me a few years ago. It's very thin. I don't know if you can really see the walls of it, but it, it, they're very very thin and the bottom is not any thicker whereas something like this you can clearly see how thick it is so what i find is these hold heat better this does not this i have trouble now i, I still use this if i'm doing a big batch of fried chicken or fried pork chops or something that's about the only thing i use this for but it can be difficult to maintain the heat of the oil. There's hot spots. So as they get bigger, they have to make the steel a little, excuse me, the cast iron a little thinner, or that would be so heavy you couldn't pick it up, or you would exceed the weight of your stove or your campfire, what you're cooking it on. Um, that particular pan that he's got right there, mm -hmm. we use that for deep frying oh. large amounts of Six. items because it's got really, really high walls. Right. And because it's bigger, the flame can be bigger. We can put it on a 20,000 or 25,000 BTU burner True. that we can't put a small one on. So, so there are reasons for it. I haven't tried this yet. How much bigger? Oh yeah, that's even bigger than my, my new lodge here, my, my big guy. But yeah, I prefer the thicker ones, but I'm gonna keep this and keep using it. Not that I make fried chicken or things like that in big batches much, but it's great to have this when I, when I need it. Myth number eight. Well, we just started to touch on this. Cast iron heats really evenly. You know, it really doesn't. And it's, it's a very easy thing to prove if you have a little digital thermometer. It, it, the, it's gonna have hot spots and it takes a little longer for it to heat up. Uh, aluminum, well, copper, stainless steel, thick bottom pans, they will heat more evenly. A lot of stainless steel pans have copper insert because copper naturally, it spreads out the heat energy into it. Cast iron, it doesn't, it doesn't conduct heat that well, but it's gonna hold on to it. So it's gonna take a while for this to heat up, for the heat to spread all through it then it's going to hold on to it. You're still probably going to have little hot spots, but it, it, it takes longer to heat this up than like so a copper pan. This leads to two things, and that is, is you never use cast iron on high heat, period. Well, and that's just that's because... That's not exactly true well, either. But when you put high heat on there immediately, thinking you're going to bring it up to temperature, right. all you do is create a hot spot in the center. Mm -hmm. So therefore, preheating cast iron, the rule is medium low for 10 minutes. The center will get hot, but after eight to 10 minutes, now the heat has spread all the way across it. It becomes even. Yeah. Also, if you were to add more than a little bit of oil, the oil spreads the temperature. So cast iron rewards patience. Yep. It holds a lot of heat, and once it gets hot, it stays hot. So another pan, you could put it on high and sort of get there, but it doesn't stay hot. You've got to keep adding heat to it. Um, and once cast iron is heated, yes, it is even heating 
from that point on, not in the preheat. Yeah, it just takes a while to get there. It also radiates heat tremendously well. And that's great for cooking like chicken and potatoes all the way through because the sides radiate heat and everything else. So a good little safety tip, even if you have those little rubber handles, those little silicon handles that fit over this, they get really hot too. So when I take this out of the oven or on the, off the stove, it's sitting somewhere, I take my kitchen towel and I do that so that everyone knows that's hot, don't touch it or use this to touch it. I mean, I've done it myself where I've completely forgotten and gone to grab it and oops, um, haven't near the hospital yet, but I've had a few blisters. Oh, there you go. Remember that cast iron pan handles get really hot. I have the scars to prove it. Yep. Yep. So a good little tip is take a kitchen towel or your oven mitt and put it on there just so. So now this answers the question okay. of about burning everything. Right, until I learned to heat cast iron on low and weight, rather than start on high, I burn everything. And the other thing is, because cast iron holds the heat, what do I always talk about in almost every episode? Carry over cooking. So you have to be careful. If you want to, you know, if you cook a steak in your cast iron and your cast iron is screaming hot and you think, oh, it's at temperature, I'm just gonna turn the fire off and leave it. Don't take that steak out of that pan because it's gonna continue to cook. And then you're going to think, oh, what burn everything? <laughs> Here's a fun one. What? I know you have a bunch of Dutch ovens. Which is your favorite color? Wow. Like the rainbow. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'd have to say, oh, I'm looking at myself backwards on the camera. This is my favorite color, though I, I think this guy, he's got a few chips. He's getting a little worn for wear. But this is one of my favorites. I think my we purple. have one, two, three, four, five, six. So oh, up of at those? camp we have red and blue. Here we have purple. We have the two green ones. We have a gray one too somewhere. Uh uh. We have red, and well, and so six if you count this one too. I have two blue ones. This size I have. We have five or six, four or five of them. Okay. Well, this next question leads into our next myth. Okay. I was told you cannot use a cast iron pan on a glass topped stove. Okay, well, and you're right. You need gas stove. Okay. That's not really true, sort of. The glass top stoves, there, there's two reasons why they recommend not. Some of the older stoves, like we had in our old house, we had a very old glass top stove and the fear was that the heat would build up and crack the glass, that this would get too hot. It's not possible. But the reality is it's because they're, they're heavy. And you drop it, set it down. Oop, you could crack your glass, especially if it's hot. Or people do this. Um, my glass top got a lot of scratches for me just inadvertently doing that. And now I'm with cast iron. So that's why they recommend that, but it really isn't true. You can use these on a glass top stove, absolutely. And now that we have induction, which is usually always a glass top, this is perfect for induction because it has to be magnetic and we, it's just perfect. You just have to be mindful of it. Yeah, and induction, by the way, because the heat doesn't radiate from the center to the mm -hmm. entire surface, actually does a really good job of bringing cast iron up to temperature in a shorter amount of time, yep. quite even. So you, absolutely, you can use yeah. it on gas, you can use yeah. it on duction, you can use it on glass, but it's the same precaution if you have a big heavy pan and right. you say don't drop it, you could chip it. So yes, that can happen, but there's no functional reason why you can't right. use it. It used to be believed that it would heat up too much and break the glass. The big thing is scratching it because we all inadvertently move our pans around and you see the chefs on TV and they're constantly with their pans, um, and that's not a good thing to do on a glass top, whether it's a cast iron pan or, or just a regular pan. Yes, we saw that. Oops. Wah, wah. Oh, sorry, wrong button, that one. That's what I meant. I spend more time scrubbing rust and reseasoning my pan than using it. Well, then you're probably not getting it fully dried when you put it away. Uh, that's why I recommend putting it on a burner, on medium, medium-high heat, letting it really get hot, 
to have all the water evaporate off and then let it cool and then while it's still warm that's when you oil it because that's going to help that seasoning keep adding up but the simpler answer is just use it more use it every single day well true but you still have to dry it properly after you um, before you put it away this is an interesting one just because you just did this <sighs> what did i just do about six months ago uh oh Oh, why is there a difference between seasoning cast iron pans and carbon steel woks? Okay, well, the two different metals. This is iron. This is iron. Steel is steel. Carbon steels, I have a carbon steel wok, and it's not seasoning it per se. It's called bluing, and it's a process you have to do before you can use it. When you get carbon steel woks, really good ones, they have a light coating of oil on it, and you have to use a... Uh, Brillo pad or steel wool pad uh, to make sure you get it all off. You have to really scrub it. And then you use a really high temperature oil like uh, grapeseed oil and you have it over a really high flame and you have to hold it there. It takes, and what, I, what did I say it took me? An hour and a half. Like an hour and a half, yeah. Right. But you hold it over the flame until it literally starts to turn blue. The metal turns blue. The metal itself turns blue. And it's a fascinating process. And, and I have a big carbon steel wok, and, and I, I had all the windows open, and my wok burner cranked all the way up, and it was really neat. Once it finally started you have happening... You to actually take the pan right. and... To and rotate it around and rotate on the heat until it goes heat, yeah. blue to the point it goes or orange. You're doing a metallurgy process. In this case, the oil is not creating the film. The oil is conducting the heat because it will not hold seasoning until the bluing process has yeah. been done. Once it's been blued, then it can be seasoned just like cast iron. Yeah, but it's a fascinating process. And once it started, it went pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. I think our son is not on, but I could swear this would be him. I want an enamel Dutch oven, but I'm not spending $300 for Le Creuset. Well, uh, I'll tell you, Sophie, uh, me too. I mean, if Le Creuset wants to sponsor us and give us stuff to, I will gladly, you know, watch, uh, be like, look at my Le Creuset. You know, they're wonderful. I, I can't spend that kind of money on them. What's the brand we get? Trom Traumatina? Yeah, um, and, and like places like ATK, America's Test Kitchen, have recommended them too. They're really affordable. They're long-lasting. The purple one behind you and all the other ones are $39. Yeah. Are blue. they going to be as good as a $300 one? No, but yeah, that's I mean, usually in the preheat stage. Once it's heated, there really isn't a difference. You know, maybe my enamel discolors a little earlier than one from Le Creuset, uh, but these are a very affordable option if you don't want to spend that much money. Oh, thank you, Ted. Yeah, uh, purple's my favorite color, as you could probably guess from the things you see. And uh, my husband spends his life looking for odd, unusual things for me that are purple. Uh, over the years, we've had some crazy things. Chatty PM, seasoning new lodge pan now using sunflower oil. Hope it works. Chatty, okay. where are you from? We can stick you on the map. Yeah. Oops, didn't want to do that. But yes, Ted, uh, we've had some unusual purple things. Purple toasters, purple garden hoses. Yeah. All right. Let's do number 10 so we can wrap these. All right. This is my favorite one. If it's rusted, it's ruined. Not so. If it's rusted through, then yeah. You know, if it's had a hole in the bottom of it or on the side that was all rust, sure, then it's ruined. But a little bit of rest of rust on it rather, you know, you, you, you let it get wet and you forgot about it, it's not the end of the world. You can just scrub it off, re-oil it, you know, get it nice and dry, re-oil it. It's not a problem at all. And people automatically think that it is. Um, like this little pan here, I haven't used it in a long time. It was probably a little wet. So up in this little cone, there's some rust and there's maybe a little bit here. But you know what? A little steel wool will take that right out. It's not affecting the pan itself. All right, and let's put Chatty on the map here. There we Minnesota. go. Minnesota. Minnesota. All right, and, and just to, to clarify, rusted through. Rusted through means if it was actually chipped or broken rust. If there's surface yeah. rust, steel surface wool, rust nothing, rub yeah. it right off, it, it'll yeah. be fine. I mean, A like, lot of people go and buy them for a dollar, 
and yep. spend a couple of hours and they're done. So for example, I use this grill pan every almost whoops, almost weekly I use this guy. And I always I, I have a love-hate relationship with it because it's heavy and it can be a little challenging to clean. I still have some buildup of gunk, but it just doesn't come off anymore. However, this is one of those flippable sides. I only ever use this side, but look at the other side. It's got rust. And even though I've scrubbed this, I don't ever oil it, I don't use it. This just sees the, the burner. It's not hurting anything at all. If I wanted to use this side, I would scrub it off with steel wool, re-season it, but I have other griddles, so I don't need to. But no, if this would rust it through and I could see light through it, then that's the problem. They say cast iron is indestructible, but you never met my husband. He broke a handle off. Wow, okay. That's kind of impressive or terrifying. I have to wonder how, how that happened. Really? Though we have some friends at train wrecks that I could, yeah, maybe see doing that. Oh, we got some people asking about the studio. Where did you get those food wall art pictures from? They're fantastic. Um, you found them, dear. Somewhere on Amazon? Yes. They were an Amazon find. I think in one of our live streams, I put the link. So when the live stream's over, I'll put the link down in the show notes for them. They're very inexpensive. They come in. We actually like them so well, we put a bunch of them up in our main kitchen upstairs, yeah. not just down here. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Got lots of questions coming up about stuff. Okay, bring it. Like why, why we do things. This one is going to be all you and take your time. Can you explain the process of how you decide on which recipe to make a video on? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Breathe. That's a tough one. That's a tough thing to answer. So I always have ideas and concepts and recipes in my head swirling, fighting each other. So a lot of times what I have to do, I need to sit down. I need to, I, I'm an old fashioned person, so I get a pen and paper and I just start writing flavors down, what looks together. Then I'll go through, so I'm looking through cookbooks. Is there anything I have here that would be in a cookbook that I could use these? So a lot of times I'll think of a flavor combination, I'll think, oh, can I make a stew out of that? Can I make a soup out of that? And then I'll look through some of my cookbooks. Maybe I'll find like some sort of stew and go, oh wait, all I have to do, use that technique with these flavors and boom, I've got it. Um, that's kind of a high level of my process, but it's kind of a frightening thing. Uh, a lot well, of times we'll I'll, have- I'll elaborate just a little more. So we'll come up with a flavor yeah. We'll, we will make the recipe multiple times. So a lot of times it But is then what times. we end up doing is saying, well, we can make it, but can our audience make it? Because remember, we are leaning the channel towards beginners or people that don't cook or don't like to cook. So if it's a recipe with a ton of ingredients or take a ton of time, or we can't do it in a nine to 11 minute episode because that's most people's attention span, right. then even though it's a good recipe, it won't make it. Right. We have to, it has to tick all the boxes. It, good flavor, it can be done in nine to 11 minutes, even though it made two hours for us to cook it and film it and all that stuff. Down. And edit um, it down. The other right. thing is accessibility you know, of ingredients. I see a lot of, of, uh, of things in the stores that I know I can get and other people can't. Um, and I have lots what, of ideas. Everyone can't get Hungarian paprika or well, you know, Chinese? Well, so for example, sunchokes, right? Not everyone can find sunchokes. We can only find them a couple times of years at Wegmans. None of the other stores around us carry them. And Wegmans doesn't even carry them all the time. It's only certain times. So whereas I love sunchokes and, and love to cook with them, I'm probably not going to do a sunchoke recipe because people are going to A, say, what's that? And B... Uh, if they can't find them, they're not going to want to make it. Sometimes we use some challenging ingredients, but only if I know that it's, if it's a new ingredient, but it's very accessible. All right, so a little uh, self-promotion here. I see we got 14 people in chat right now. 
Can everyone take a second and hit that like button? It makes a big deal. There's 14 of you and only seven likes. Yay. And if you haven't subscribed, hit that subscribe button. So let's talk about what's coming up. Uh -huh. I have some notes because the last few weeks when we've gotten here, I, I've kind of like, you distracted me and I lost my train of thought. And... So what's coming up next? For Last Celebrate TV. Uh, Friday's cocktail episode will be a blood orange blossom cocktail. Uh, it's actually an orange blossom cocktail, but we're using blood oranges this week. And it's brilliant. It's delicious. You're going to see our, our uh, buzzed bunny cocktail coming up before Easter, too. Um, what else? Uh, if you've ever heard of Welsh rarebit, not Welsh rabbit, Welsh rarebit, uh, the... Most of it is kind of like a cheese sauce on toast. I have a little different twist on it, so it's, it's gonna be coming up. It's basically a fancy grilled cheese, but it's, it's a fun thing to do. Um, we have clam chowder Rhode Island style coming up. And Rhode Island clam chowder is lighter and brothy and tastes like clams. Uh, a lot of times New England clam chowder tastes like cream and delicious heaviness and Manhattan is tomatoey and maybe spicy, but this tastes fresh and like clams. And you can make it with canned clams. That's was a uh, one of those recipes where we've been experimenting. First, I used fresh clams, then we made it with canned clams. So we'll show you how to do it. And so there's a reality of cooking for the show. Right. We made it with fresh clams. Not everyone has access to fresh clams. Not everybody wants to spend the half an hour to cook those clams and prep them for the right. recipe. Right. So we, then we said, let's see how it tastes with canned clams. And frankly, it was fine. Yeah. So it became the recipe. Mm -hmm. We may do it with fresh on camera just to show you because people may be inspired to do that. But you can certainly make, uh, make it with canned clams. Another recipe now, you know I'm not a baker. So we have two baked desserts coming up. One is a black walnut cake from our friend David Brown. Uh, after me begging and pleading for years, he finally shared his recipe with me. So we're going to be making that coming up soon. And uh, I have a signature dessert that is a fresh fruit tart. And it uses my Scottish shortbread recipe as the crust. And there's a few surprises in it. But we're going to be combining that with a basic skills episode because you need to make pastry cream. So I'm going to teach you how to make pastry cream. It's very, very easy. Uh, and then we're gonna, in another episode, make this fruit tart. So it'll be really fun. It's really one of those simple things. It's gonna be complicated for us to film, but to actually make, it's very simple. Black walnut cake sounds amazing. It is, Ted, and it, yeah, it really is. And it's not a cake mix. It's not a box mix that you throw walnuts in. It's a from scratch recipe, and uh, yeah. It actually tastes like walnuts. No, we did not. What? Didn't, Didn't we have, have that, that last, last night? night? We had the fruit tart last night. Oh, okay. I thought he was talking about the walnut fruit no. tart. Yeah, okay. And of course, what is our next live stream, dear? You want to tell them? It's shrimply delicious. It's going to be all things shrimp. Recipes. What can you do with shrimp? How do you clean a shrimp? Uh, whatever you can think of. We're, we're actually going to be doing a lot of cooking in that episode. We're going to make several shrimp dishes. Instead of me just standing here talking and lecturing you, and uh, we will be cutting up and cooking and answering your questions. And we scheduled that because Easter is coming up. Easter is coming, and, and people... people have been asking, Yep. I'm hosting Easter this year. What can I do? So you're going to want to drink a few of my orange or carrot cocktails first if, if you're hosting your family. And... Uh, I am currently making carne asada on a cast iron grill pan. Is there a way to clean those with ridges in the pan? I use a scrub brush. I use a nylon scrub brush to do mine. And I think that the key is to, as soon as it's cooled down, that you can handle it safely, clean it right away with hot soapy water and, and scrub in there with a scrub brush. I think that's also one of those ones of putting a inch of water and boiling it would at least loosen up the particles. Well, but you couldn't you couldn't really put an inch of water on this. No, but if it was a griddle pan like you have like, there. Like, yeah, yeah, if it, if it were. If it was one of those. If it's like this kind, then sure, put some water in it an inch or so, a couple inches, and, and boil it. If it's this big flat client, 
I use a scrub brush, but I use a scrub brush on this too. But again, this is smaller, it can go right in a soapy sink. Just don't soak it. Overnight. All right, oh, and somebody was paying attention. What? Because the week after, though I don't have a card for it. Oh, I saw you have a live stream on cutting boards coming up. I can't wait. Yeah, that's true, we do. Yeah. And we are trying to make a concerted effort to have the next two or three live stream topics already out there so we can get a lot of questions from our Facebook people. So even though we have, we had 14 and 16 people in here live from YouTube, there's 20 some odd watching from Facebook. We just can't get their comments. We have to type them in ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Or they send them to us ahead of they time. They send it to us ahead of time. Once they see what the topic is. All right, so how do they send us information, Derek? Info at let's celebrate TV. So yeah, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, go to our website, let's celebrate TV. All right. All right. So I think we're coming up to time, aren't we already? We are coming up wow. to time. So let me get my correct screens here. And wait, our son was not on and didn't invite himself to dinner. Oh goody goody. We got to go to sleep early tonight. Hey. <sighs> and uh Fortunately for me, I'm on vacation this coming week because tomorrow's my Fest. birthday. It's Pete Fest. Tomorrow's my birthday. I turned the big 55. I don't know how that happened. <sighs> so, yeah, I'm on vacation. All right. Yay. So All that right. means tomorrow when I get home from work, we have to shoot another episode for Tuesday. Yeah, because we're kind of behind in filming because I was. we had a dinner party yesterday. And, uh, yeah, I, I had to cook for that. That was my present to myself. So instead of filming, we did that. All right. So from me, Phil Gordimer. And from me, Peter Lee. We will see you all next time. And uh, keep on celebrating. Cheers.